Great. Thank you so much. Um, welcome all. Um, we'll go ahead and get this meeting to order or call this meeting to order. And I think what we'll get started. We, we, have a quorum. we do have a quorum. Thank you for confirming, Farla. Um, so the first thing we'll want to do consistent with the agenda, we'll go ahead and take a vote on the main minutes. Did anyone have any edits or changes we needed to make to the main minutes? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the main minutes? So moved, Steve. Thank you, Steve. May I get a second, please? I'll second. Thank you, Farla. Um, and if folks could, members could go ahead and vote in the chat to approve the minutes. And it looks like we've got six votes in and I think that's our quorum there. Um, so the minutes are approved, thank you so much. We'll also be voting today on a nomination to the HIV Services Planning Council for, for Kay Palupa. Um, as a little bit of background, if anyone hasn't had a chance to read the attached letter that was on the agenda, um, Ms. Palupa is a special program section chief for the HIV care branch at the California Department of Public Health Office of AIDS. Her knowledge of housing opportunity for people with AIDS, AIDS Medi-Cal waiver program, and the housing, the housing Plus project, as well as the Minority AIDS Initiative, will be an asset to the council. The council has asked for FAB's approval of Ms. Palupa. Is there a motion for Ms. Palupa's approval and seat for in the council? I'll, I vote to approve. Thank you, Farla. And a second? I can second. I'll second the approval. Um, if everyone, all the members can vote in the chat to approve Ms. Palooza's appointment to the HIV Health Services Planning Council at this time. Okay, we have uh, six votes to approve. I think we've got five, Farla. I think Sarah's. Yeah. Um, There's Fikalu, thank you. I think that Fikalu. makes us six. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great, oh, thank you. Um, no, he voted. Yeah, I, I counted him twice. Okay, one, two, three. Yeah, good, good to go. Great, thank you all. Um, so next we'll move on to some updates. So it looks like Dr. Casiri maybe a little bit later. So we'll actually go over then to Dr. Damiano for an update from Primary Health. Um, and then if we could also bring up the update document that she shared with us and share with the group, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, while we're waiting for the document to get uploaded. Oh, you guys don't see it? No. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, oh, now it's coming. It. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, you probably have to scroll a little further. I put in uh, quite a bit of information in here, so uh, we can go over some of it really quickly, and then you can slow me down where you need to slow down. Uh, this was our COVID data as of last Wednesday. We do a weekly dashboard. Uh, we only had one COVID case in the jails. It's been really good. We've had a break from COVID from from about March 9th uh, till last week. But as the community transmission started to increase, we're seeing more patients come in, arrestees come in with COVID. So today in the jail, we have seven uh, individual patients that have COVID um, in the jail coming through our intake booking loop. So you'll see increases starting next week uh, with the COVID transmission rates. For inmate vaccinations, as of last week, we only had 23 new doses, which are a variety of initial doses, uh, second doses, and booster doses. Uh, what we have found is that people uh, refuse uh, vaccination quite a bit. 
Uh, they mainly refuse when we are at a low. When we start doing outbreaks, then they want to get vaccinated when we're in the middle of the outbreak. If, if you scroll a little bit further, you can see somebody asked me for inmate vaccination data over time. This is a snapshot of our average daily population census and the percentage that has had a partial or full vaccination. You can see it's pretty low. It's about a quarter of the average daily population. And uh, that's partly because of the high turnover rate that we experience in the jails and people's reluctance to get the COVID vaccination. If you scroll a little further, you can see that inmates who are in the jail for at least 30 days, um, they are more likely to have at least one vaccine dose. So 90% who are in custody more than 30 days ultimately get a COVID vaccination dosage. On the next one, we continue for the medical staff to look at our own vaccination rates. They're very high. We're still under that state public health order, which requires, and I've interpreted it as all medical and mental health need to get vaccinated. Um, and our booster rates are also in there as for contracted as well as for county employees. If you scroll a little farther, you can see our average daily population. Uh, that data is through, I think, April. And you can see we're pro approaching pre-pandemic population rates. Uh, this is hard uh, when you have communicable disease and it's always hard to have enough services to treat uh, this much of a population. If you scroll down again, you can see our jail releases by length of stay. This is the April data that I got from the Sheriff's Department and I just aggregated it. You can see that we have a large number of releases that are never housed in the jail and that uh, individuals are released within three days makes up almost 60% of our population. 74% of the population is discharged within 14 days. So we have the extremes of very short stay population, which causes a lot of uh, churn. And then we have these long county inmates uh, that have been there for quite a long period of time. So there's a huge variance uh, and you have to tailor services around those two populations. Uh, if you scroll again, You'll see a little bit of information on our nurse intakes. Uh, they do an average of over 2,300 intakes on all new arrestees per month, which is an awful lot. And then I added the homeless uh, feature so that about 30% of our people that we're intaking meet the criteria for the definition of homelessness, which is the same definition used by HRSA and by our director of homelessness initiatives. Okay, if you scroll a little bit more for chronic health conditions, for this particular point in time, which was a day on April 27th, we had an inmate population of 3,319. Of those, 69% had one or more chronic health conditions. So very high percentage of people have a chronic health condition and of those with a chronic health condition, 65% had two or more chronic health conditions. These could be physical health conditions like diabetes. It could be a serious mental disorder like schizophrenia, or it could be a substance use disorder. Most of our people have comorbidities. Okay, for administrative data, uh, we are still really high on vacancies. You can see for our medical staff, 30 vacancies, primarily in the nursing series and physicians. If we go to the next page. For administrative uh, staff, we've done quite a bit better. So those have decreased down to five with most of them in background checks with the sheriff's department. And our mental health staff, we have 10 openings. They're doing much better. They had about 20 before. So they've been kind of ratcheting uh, those uh, vacancies down. I also wanted to share, not on the PowerPoint, but uh, basically um, the county executive has published 
the recommended budget. So you can see that on the webpage. And for adult correctional health, we have asked, and there are 39 FTE positions in adult correctional health budget in a variety of positions, as well as an augmentation to mental health. Uh, and then I have some other uh, positions that are being recommended for other primary health programs. I won't probably go into all of those. I know you're primar primarily interested in the corrections. And then lastly, I did not get to an opportunity to go to the board hearing that was on the criminal justice component from our sub working group but I did catch some of it on the internet and thought people did a great job. And I just wanted to say that to you. So thank you. Uh, did anybody have any questions? I, I have a, a question. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you for the thank you, Sandy. <laughs> um, it was great. Um, the, the committees did terrifically well. Um, so I was just curious, the, the six physician positions that are open, is, is there any specialty that's required or it's any yes. general? Yeah, these are all for primary care physicians, internal medicine, uh, so forth for our facility. We have contracted, uh, we have contractors that are specialty. So we have some specialists that work on site and then we have specialty out, out of house, but those are mainly contracted. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Looks like Liz Blum has a question, Liz, if you want. Sure. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, I, I have some questions about um, recently, I think within the last two weeks or so, there have been two deaths um, for, uh, in, of individuals who were in custody. Um, obviously very tragic and heartbreaking. Um, and I, I have some questions around um, the process of determining cause of death. Um, and, you know, in the most recent headline, it, it sort of announced cause of death, but I thought that the coroner kind of investigates. And um, so, yeah, they're, they're two separate cases. Um, so I just wondered if you could speak on like how, um, cause of death is determined after um, loss of life happens in the jail or, or within custody and also how families are notified. Um, Cause I've spoken to family members before who, who aren't immediately contacted and that's um, just is so tragic to me. So I just wonder if you can share anything you know, thank you. Okay, thank you uh, Liz for that question. So I can't comment on the particulars because we are a health uh, HIPAA entity. But what I can tell you is there's a pretty involved process on both the medical side and also on the sheriff's department side. So what happens is that we do um, within certain time frames administrative review of the case, but then we also look at um, a clinical mortality review and look at those steps. Um, in terms of cause of death, what happens in, in many circumstances, the coroner's office um, does the review and the cause of death. Um, that takes a while because it's an autopsy, they do tests, they have to rule out suspected, um, you know, a suspicious death, so it's fairly time consuming for them. On some cases uh, where the person was in hospital and died and they were under the care of physician, so during some of those times, the physician's death certificate may be in place of the coroner's office. But you're, you're absolutely correct, correct. It is under the purview of the coroner's office and not under medical or the sheriff's department. Uh, the sheriff's department uh, will notice uh, families. Uh, so I can't quite comment on that. The sheriff's office has been doing press releases uh, on fairly, uh, I think regularly during this particular year, which I don't think they had done as regularly before. So they're getting information out from their perspective. I don't know if I touched on everything you asked for, Liz. Um, yeah, thank you, That that is helpful. And yeah, I guess I'm just, I wonder why the 
you know, like the cause of death, death was sort of announced in the most recent one as yeah. it was yeah, before the before the investigation, which is, um, you know, an, a little frustrating, you know. Correct. Like, so yeah. th that, that is not correct. You're absolutely right. We wait for the coroner's official autopsy and report of cause. And as people know, it could either be natural it could be accidental, it could be suicide, or it could be homicide. Those are the causes of death. And then there's more detail about contributors. Okay, hey, we have Mac, his hand is up. Sure. Thank you kindly. I think I just wanted to make sure that I heard correctly, Sandy, when you said that 30% um, of intakes are, un are qualifying as homeless people. Um, and then I wanted to just make sure, just clarify these points that, that I heard. So 30% of, of intakes are qualifying as homeless people. And then 74% of our population is out within less than 14 days. Okay, um, so good question. So yes, what we do is we have an indicator on the nurse intake and the homeless definition I wrote in the PowerPoint, but it's living in a place not meant for human habitation, which could be a street, a car, river, camp. It's in a shelter, transitional housing, or exiting some other institution where they temporarily resided. So when nurses intake, about 30% of the population meets that definition. Uh, I've also looked at a uh, point in time for the average daily population. It's a similar number. So it's fairly frequent um, that that's true. For the 74%, um, you're actually correct, have a length of stay of 14 days or less. And that number has been pretty consistent over time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think Libby had a question. Thanks, Dr. Damiano. Um, I actually wanted to just kind of build off of Liz's question. As you know, one of the things that we're still trying to understand after looking into this issue for a year and change is just kind of like all of your processes that you and your team have for learning and addressing the issues related to the maid's consent decree. So when there is a death in the jail, sort of what kinds of audits or reviews are there to understand to sort of like learn from that tragedy and connect it back to corrective reforms? Is there any sort of insight you could give on that process? Yeah, so it's pretty extensive. Our initial administrative review looks at whether there was any uh, systemic issues with emergency response. And that could be from the sheriff's department or from the medical side of the house. When we do the um, preliminary mortality review, and we call it preliminary because there's no coroner's findings for quite some time, we're looking at not only what happened with this individual's death, but we look at the whole episode of care. So there may be some systemic issues that aren't clearly a nexus with the death, or maybe there are, but we look at whatever of those systemic issues need to be addressed, and do we need a plan of correction for those systemic issues. If it's not a systemic issue, but maybe a staff issue, we will look at what's needed for that staff person, whether it's um, some kind of personnel uh, training or action. So those are looked at. Um, additionally, our class counsel and medical experts review every death, all the documentation, all the way up from our clinical reviews to the autopsies, everything. So we have a oh, couple that's really couple helpful to understand. Yeah, sorry, I was going to ask if they were shared, but it sounds like, like, are they shared publicly or just to the class council? No, yeah, it's person? this. This is HIPAA protected information, yeah. so we can't. But uh, through our class council, they obviously can review, and our medical experts uh, review it all, every document. And then during our Title 22 audits, which are our public health audits, uh, which we stopped for a while during the pandemic, the public health team also reviews. So we do get uh, several reviews. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful to understand. Sure. I don't know if there's any other questions. And then part of the work group, I provided a copy of my status report, which has a lot more detail in it. There's only so much you wanna probably hear about during this meeting. 
Thank you, Dr. Damiano. It doesn't mm -hmm. look like there are any other questions, but definitely appreciate the public health or the, the primary health, public health update. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so it looks like next we'll go to Andrew Mendoza, who will provide an update on substance use prevention and treatment. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm here also with uh, my colleague, Lori Miller, our division manager of the Substance Use Prevention and Treatment Unit. <clears throat> Lori, feel free to jump in if I miss anything on our report. Septi, we've been super busy uh, doing lots of great things out there in the community, uh, working with our partners over in behavioral health and public health, primary care, you name it. We are involved in some level or getting uh, some great things out there. Um, with you all. So I just want to go over and just provide a couple updates. Um, first, we had our, um, recently we had our fentanyl town hall. Uh, that was a second one that we had. It was a virtual format. Uh, it was well attended. Uh, we were able to have our district attorney, Anne-Marie Schubert there, uh, folks from the fire department, uh, a variety of experts on there, folks that have lost someone to uh, fentanyl poisoning uh, or fentanyl overdose. And so we, uh, it was uh, great information. We were able to share great information about fentanyl, the side effects, how to um, get Narcan, how to administer Narcan. Um, it was just a great event. And this is in line with our continued um, desire to get the word out about the dangers of fentanyl, uh, about counterfeit pills, 99, over 99% of counterfeit uh, pills out there are counterfeit. So we're really trying to work hard to get the information out there. Um, to our schools, to our communities, and to our stakeholders and partners. So that was well attended. Great. We'll be having another one in the very near future. Our very own Lori Miller moderated that. And uh, like I said, it was, uh, it was great. It's uh, available online uh, to watch. And I'll put that link in the chat after I get done. Uh, feel free to check it out. And uh, our last one had almost 500 going on almost 600 views our last one that we did. And so this one, we expect to have just as much, if not more um, views. January 10th, we have our summit, our marijuana uh, prevention summit coming up. I'll put a link in the uh, chat also. It's done by um, our um, Sacramento Coalition for Youth and uh, it's, a, it's a great summit, uh, great information out there. As we know, marijuana continues to be a problem for youth, um, continues to be a problem in our schools. Uh, a lot of youth wanting to figure out how not to become involved with that or how to stop using that. So. Um, we're there with some great resources uh, and also there to partner with our coalitions and our prevention partners um, as well. We have a couple coalition meetings coming up. First of all, our July opioid coalitions coming up on July 18th. Uh, as you as uh, you probably have heard about uh, this in the past, this coalition is made up of healthcare professionals, law enforcement, uh, behavioral health professionals, doctors, nurse practitioners, you name it. Everybody coming together to try to address the opioid um, epidemic that we have here in Sacramento County. So I'll put the link uh, there as well. If you're interested, feel free to sign up. And if you want more information on anything I share today, feel free to reach out to me or, or send me a chat message and I'll get you all the information. Additionally, in August, we have our Meth Coalition. Again, another great coalition comprised of folks from all different disciplines and um, different areas and service lines within the county and, and other government agencies. That's going to be coming up on August the 11th. I'll put the link again in the chat when, we, when I get done here. Um, another exciting thing that I want to share, I know I've mentioned this in a couple of meetings in the past, contingency management pilot uh, from the state of California Department of Health Care Services, Sacramento County, we're one of the um, handful of counties that will be piloting this. For those of you that don't know, contingency management is an evidence-based, uh, really um, uh, innovative approach about uh, to address stimulant use disorders, so may, uh, mainly methamphetamine, for example. And so basically it's um, giving folks a, a little monetary incentive on a gift card or something as they continue to um, produce negative res uh, test results showing that they're not using methamphetamine or stimulants. And so it has great, uh, it has great um, outcomes in other studies across the nation. Uh, we're excited to be part of uh, this, piloting this here in Sacramento County. And we're hopeful that the results of this will um, allow this to be a permanent um, Medi-Cal beneficiary benefit that we can pay for moving forward. So uh, more to come on that, but we're gonna be launching a pilot in fall. Uh, we were supposed to launch, uh, uh, I think right, right about now, but the state asked to push it back a little bit. So we're ready to go. We have our providers uh, lined up. We have uh, three great providers that'll be doing this with clients in Sacramento. And again, if you want some more information, feel free to let me know and I'll get you some uh, information on contingency management. Uh, we are also uh, actively recruiting new providers. I know folks in the past, 
in meetings have said, you know, what's up with the residential? What's up with detox? We need more providers out there. <laughs> well, we hear you. We are doing uh, uh, work, Lori, myself, uh, a couple of my staff. We're all out there meeting with new providers. We met with a very large national conglomerate, a big name in the forensic um, uh, mental health uh, area, substance abuse, and correctional health. And they're uh, talking with us right now about possibly bringing out a significant infrastructure project here in Sacramento, which will make a huge uh, dent in our um, in our continuum in a good way, uh, really increase the amount of beds out there. So hopefully we'll be able to share more about that in the future. Right now, we're just in preliminary uh, discussions about what they're looking for, what we need, and how we might be able to make this happen. We've also met with uh, about six different residential providers both in Sacramento and in neighboring counties as well to try to identify contract opportunities. So we have places to send our clients who need withdrawal management and residential services. So more to come on that. We recently executed our contract. I just signed it literally minutes ago. I think Lori's next up to sign it with our, with our UC Davis uh, partners. We're very, very excited about this. As you all know, I think I talked about this in previous meetings, but uh, this is going to be a game changer for Sacramento County. We're gonna be contracting with UC Davis. They're gonna be doing inductions in the ED, getting folks uh, services right then and there as folks come into the ED versus the old way of doing things where they give you a name, a number and tell you to go report at, on Monday or go somewhere else on Monday um, to, uh, to an appointment. They're actually able to start services then and there. So again, a game changer. We're excited to have that. Hopefully that'll take off, get some good traction and we'll hopefully be able to partner with other hospital systems to do the same kind of great work that UC Davis is gonna do for us. Uh, last, but uh, and we also uh, recently started contracting with a telehealth provider out of Southern California. Again, this is innovative. If you take anything from my report today, it is Sacramento County BHS SUFD. We are extremely innovative lately, thanks to our leadership, Lori and Dr. Quist, uh, really thinking outside the box. So this was another thing that we're like, you know what, we don't have this. Why not? Why not try? So we found a provider that does telehealth that wants to do all telehealth, all kinds of services via virtual platform. We've entered a contract with this uh, with this group, Let's Recover, and uh, they'll be launching here any day now. So again, we'll have some great, hopefully, updates for you in the next couple of months uh, to tell you how that's working. So we're really trying to reduce all the barriers, no wrong door, uh, folks that are ready. You can get started in the ER. You can get on a platform, talk to somebody on your computer, on your phone, go to one of our providers and walk in. So we're really trying to make access as extremely easy as possible. Last but not least, uh, I think some of you may know, but I uh, wanted to let you know that I will actually be uh, leaving my post with uh, SUPTI. I accepted a promotion within Primary Health, so I'll be a division manager over the health center on Stockton Boulevard and Broadway, so probably be meeting with most of you still in a different way, uh, but excited for that promotion, but also very sad to be leaving SUPTI. We're doing such great work. Um, and uh, so after the 20th of June, I'll be promoting, and then Lori will take over, so all questions can be directed to um, Lori Miller until my uh, replacement is interviewed and decided I could take months, who knows. So that's all I have. Lori, anything on your side? <clears throat> all right. No, thank you, Andrew. Great report. Appreciate it. Farla. Hi, Andrew. I just wanted to congratulate you and tell you, let you know how sad we are to lose you. <laughs> but you've been doing such incredible work and we, we so appreciate all the updates and all, all the progress that um, Subti has made, which is amazing. I mean, uh, on so many fronts. Um, so uh, we'll just continue to uh, hear from you. I'm sure, um, and you'll go on to be doing great stuff where you're going. Thank you, Farla. He may be able to, after he checks with his current or his new leadership, still be able to be part of PHAB. I'm hoping that's the case so he can bring a perspective um, from his new um, position onto this board as well. So that'll be him on that. Yeah, uh, that'll be lovely. And maybe even a, a view from higher up. So we'll be getting a, a bigger picture, potentially. Um, I just wanted to ask you one question, a Andrew. So I was having a conversation and somebody was talking about Narcan and uh, I'm in a different state, by the way. So that's why I'm I'm kind of, um, it's uh, thanks to now for taking um, the role of facilitator. But I was having a conversation with somebody who was um, who works in the area uh, of mental health and in the hospitals, and they they were talking about how 
if they wanted somebody wanted to get a Narcan kit here, you know, they they'd have to go to the pharmacy and like pay thirty dollars or something. And I was wondering if if I was in SAC and I wanted a Narcan kit like now, where would it go and how, how much would it cost? And great, great question. I'll put a couple flyers in the chat as well, places that you can go. Um, we, we there, there, it's located a lot of different places. I just heard just literally days ago that Sutter Health uh, is now giving out Narcan out of their emergency department. So the Sutter Medical Center downtown, they are now uh, issuing uh, Narcan out of the ED. So patients that come in or folks that come in, they have Narcan available uh, to them. Um, there's, it's available at a lot of different our, our harm reduction partners. Uh, there's a lot of places to get it. You can also go to the pharmacy. And I think, Laurie, you were saying that there's a different couple, uh, a bigger dose of Narcan available for a, um, for a price. Uh, and you can definitely pay yeah. out of pocket for it if you want. Uh, but there's certainly lots of places in Sacramento to get it free of charge. And right now, um, our SEPTA unit is providing um, some stock that we have to our um, other departments here in the county as we're also working on a naloxone distribution county ride projects where we want to have Narcan available in all of our public facing lobbies. So we're still working on that, but um, we do have some in our SEPTA unit that we can provide and Andrew's going to put some um, flyers in the chat for organizations. You can order your own through the naloxone distribution project and through that project it is two doses of four milligrams. Um, but you can also get it from a pharmacy, an eight milligram uh, dose from a pharmacy for about 60 bucks. It, it, would it be available in places like loaves and fishes? That's, that's, yeah, on that's, our our list. that's on our list of places that was identified, uh, loaves and fishes, uh, a lot of clinics, anything that's community facing, anything that's county lobby. Uh, Lori's working with Siobhan on this. This is a very, very large project. We're trying to think about getting vending machines out there. Uh, just basically, uh, our goal is to have Narcan so widely available, you get sick of seeing it. That's our goal. But yeah, loaves and fishes, for example, clinics, uh, providers, everything that was already identified as places we want to have Narcan at. Okay, I'm looking forward to being um, particularly sick of seeing it. <laughs> Definitely. Me too. Me too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have Mac Bay and them. Yeah, super big shout out to y'all's work around Narcan um, and super big shout out to Harm Reduction Services Insane in town that have been doing this for a long time. And they actually, and I'm excited that y'all will work with them because I know that they have a lot of these community connections because they've been forward facing and been going out to encampments for a long time. I'm excited to see Narcan on this county on every corner. That is so exciting. Um, but Andrew, I actually was hoping that maybe you could elaborate <clears throat> a little bit when you said that you're exploring contracts with big names in forensic, um, forensic behavioral health, correctional health, that would make a huge dent in the system. I think my, my question is like, maybe if you could elaborate a little bit, and I don't know if you're allowed to tell us exactly who those partners are, but maybe like um, in what ways they plan on making that dent in the system. I know I'll speak just um, from like the organization I'm representing that we um, are, wondering about a new mental health annex jail annex you know um and things like that <clears throat> and so just like i said trying to figure out in what ways y'all anticipate making that huge dent um whether or not you can alleviate my worry about a new jail mental health annex when we shouldn't be putting mental you know folks inside of cells but things like that um so yeah if you could elaborate that would be very helpful you bet. And I'll have uh, Lori also. She, I know she was also in some meetings with it as well. Um, what I can tell you, uh, probably uh, not able to share names of, of this particular provider right now. We are strictly, uh, Lori and I's purpose is strictly to get residential treatment beds for substance use disorder and withdrawal management beds. That's our particular focus right now. Some organizations have come in and said, you know, we can also do, we can also help out mental health and give mental health beds. Uh, we can also, you know, do other things, and that's great. And we're handing those folks that, you know, these providers off to our counterparts in mental health, correctional health, for example, whatever that, you know, need may be. But we are not having conversations at all in regards to, like, you know, correctional health, correctional mental health, anything like that. That is outside of what we're looking for. Uh, but if a provider comes in, for example, and says, "Oh yeah, we also do A, B, and C. Are you guys interested?" You know, we're able to hand those people off to. Um, those those entities, but we're not engaging in conversations around those topics. Laurie, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. Nothing more to add. No, we would just refer them to the leadership um, over those programs. 
I think Sarah and then uh, Joe Paul. Sarah, yeah, Sarah has her hand up. Hi, Sarah? I think, yep, yeah. hi, sorry, just takes a minute to get off mute. Um, excited to hear about the UC Davis program, uh, referral program, fantastic news. And it'll be interesting to see how that one uh, plays out and can be expanded. I'm gonna go back to the Narcan discussion. So if I'm understanding correct, correctly, we're saying that here in California do not need a prescription. Is that correct for Narcan? And number two, what is the age of, what's the limitation on the age of somebody say was 16 and wanted to access Narcan under 18? It's a good question. I'd have to do some research on that. I'm not entirely sure um, because it is technically a, a prescription medication. So I'm not sure how that changes the law, given that, yeah, it, it, what, what is a minor? Is it the 12 and up consent, which is pretty standard in most of our industries? Right. Um, I'm not sure if that applies. I don't want to misspeak to the legal side of it. So I'd have okay, to get some information. Because I think it would be really great to understand what's the age of consent for Marcan and then be able to relate that to, if I could be so bold, the adolescent working group. Um, that's also looking at some of the mental health issues and perhaps finding a way to for the things that can be done in policy with that regards. But thank you. Thanks for all your efforts. We'll, get some, clarity, um, we'll get some clarity on that. I was just on a call with the Department of Health Care Services this morning around trying to get Narcan out to youth. And so I think their age um, is 12 and up, obviously, for consent to treat. And so I'm thinking that's what where the age <laughs> range is. But uh, we'll get some clarity around that in terms of how young. But they're certainly um, wanting it out there for you know our, our teenage population, 16 and up, uh, for sure, because that's where we're seeing the fentanyl poisonings. So I think it's really great to have like it available, right? But then we have to tease out what are the access issues. So it can be available, but then I need to get you know, a prescription which requires my mom or, right? Like how do you actually qualify to get your hands on it? <clears throat> we might see it everywhere, but we don't want it to get stuck everywhere, right? We all know that I'm preaching to the choir, but I worry about sort of the criteria and the ways to actually get it out of there into somebody's hand. Great Especially question. Let me do some follow-up. I'm married to a pharmacist as well. So a lot of times she has some great um, go check here or whatever. So I will ask her over dinner tonight. And awesome. uh, we'll, also, we'll also consult our leadership and our, our folks in uh, right. around us. And um, um, at the next um, update, at the next meeting, I'll go ahead and give you guys an update. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you again. Great work and congratulations on your promotion. Thanks. Okay, so we have Joe Fulon. Thank you. And I apologize for being a couple of minutes late, uh, Mr. Mendoza. So thank you again for your hard work. I really sincerely hope you don't have to bring up work to your dinner this evening because my wife will kill me. I probably won't even need Narcan to help me if I bring up work. But um, and, and speaking about access, I was just wondering, what's the possibility that we can kind of improve our cultural competency on the distribution of this information? Um, so that's one thing. Second is that have we had a chance to look at further uh, allowing the distribution uh, model to not just the county staff or the loaves of fishes, but you know we now have a uh, kind of a vol volunteers from SAC Regional Transit that have an MSW background. I don't know if there's a, a limitation on on who can handle the prescriptions, but these are the folks that really do deal with a lot of um, at risk individuals. And then also, I guess my third question would be, uh, how could we as PHAB help? Um, in, in a kind of a greater advocacy and, and, and um, kind of statewide discussions on what we can do in Sacramento County. So uh, just, just two cents and I appreciate your time. Thank you. I'll take question one and two and I'll defer to my, my boss on question three about how PHAP can better help the larger picture. Um, so as for getting it out, uh, you know, we definitely are very blessed. One of our staff are um, very, very involved in our behavioral health racial equity um, committee for Sacramento County Behavioral Health. Um, we, we consult her constantly on how we can do better with getting information out to really breaking down the barriers, the racial, uh, you know, the racial barriers that might be there about getting information and getting this out. Um, and so we are uh, in the process, you know, the information that we have will be translated into our, um, into our threshold languages. So that's a start. Uh, we're also, um, you know, getting this information out in a variety of committees and a, a variety of work groups. Uh, that are specifically focused on exactly what you said is how do we overcome these issues? How do we make sure that everybody knows about this? Everyone has equal access to this. So it is part of ongoing conversations that we have. 
uh, both like, for example, in the VREC and then also just as we roll stuff out, making sure that's going through the right work groups to make sure that, again, we're, we're meeting all of the uh, needs that you brought up. The second uh, thing, as for who can give it out, we, you know, we would love to hear ideas as Lori's working on this countywide uh, distribution. I think it's a great idea. I added it to my list as you were talking, RT is a great idea. We should definitely have uh, Narcan on buses, absolutely, on the, on the light rail. Uh, and so I added that to my listing. It's a great idea. But but as for who can give it out, we have um, uh, give out events uh, through on, in the community. We're going to be doing one probably in the next couple of months out there. And, and literally, Lori and I were giving out. We gave out 400, uh, 400 boxes of Narcan. And we literally, anybody who wants it can get it. And so you don't have to give a prescription. You don't have to show any voter registration or any of that nonsense. You walk up, you get a box of Narcan, you go home. And so it's really that easy. Uh, and so certainly, you know, I like your idea. But yeah, if you can think of any other ideas, like, you know, we're doing loaves and fishes, but I like RT, anything that interacts with the public, we want Narcan at. That's the simple answer. And that's what Laurie and I's goal is. As for your third uh, question, we punch it over to Laurie. Yeah, I'll just add to that response, Andrew. Thank you. Um, I would just say that we certainly want it out there, but um, in terms of the county ordering it from the Naloxone Distribution Project, we can only give it out to county entities, but Andrew's going to put a flyer in the chat. Um, so any organization can order it themselves, any particular uh, amount uh, themselves uh, through the Naloxone Distribution Project. Um, there's a process to take. It's very simple. Um, it takes about three to four weeks to receive back. Uh, in terms of whatever uh, quantity that you order. So right now through the county project, I can only distribute it through county entities unless it's a public uh, event. Um, but I encourage all of you, if you're not a county program, um, to order it yourself and have it available. And it's all free too. Uh, Lori and I are putting an order in for 5,000 doses, all free. Narcan, uh, the, the state provides us free of charge for organizations. Just a quick question about the organizations. Like, do they have to have like, cause I just know a lot of mutual aid groups in town who don't have like a fiscal status, um, who do deliver Narcan to communities all over Sacramento County. And so are they able to order through that program? And if so, can we drop the link to that in the chat to like how to get the, that information to folks? Absolutely. I have a literally a one page flyer. It's how to order Narcan. And it literally goes over what organizations and, and the ones that you mentioned are all, that would definitely fall underneath the um, the allowed. It's very, very uh, DHCS has made it very loose on who can order it. It's pretty much if you serve the public or you interface with the public, you you qualify. So, um, yeah, but there'll be a flyer. Looks like Liz wants me to send everything to uh, um, to her and I'll send it on and then she'll be sharing it with the group. Uh, Liz, do you want me to put anything in the chat or do you want me to send it to you directly? Yeah, feel free to put it in the chat and okay. we can reach out as well as just compile it together for okay. the PHAP website. Sounds good. Well, thank you, everybody. Didn't mean to take up all your time. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Andrew and Lori. And again, congratulations, Andrew, on the promotion. And we're so happy to hear about all these amazing updates. I'm personally very excited about contingency management. So I think that's so cool. <laughs> Um, appreciate you all and also for taking, um, responding to all the questions that came up. Um, so next we'll go to the next agenda item and as it relates to the executive committee, we actually have an opening on our executive committee that we're hoping to fill. Um, we have five place, five spaces right now with that one opening. So we'd like to take some time today to raise and accept any nominations um, for an executive committee member. You can nominate another person, you can nominate yourself. Um, so I'd like to just open up the floor to members to nominate themselves or another member for the executive committee vacancy. I would just add that it's um, a once a month meeting on Tuesday at five o'clock on the third Tuesday of every month. And we are a very fun group. <laughs> and, and things happen in the executive committee meetings. Um, they're open to the public, so you can, uh, um, anybody can attend. But um, I would encourage members um, to, uh, to check it out, um, to, to, think, to nominate um, somebody here today. Okay. I can put myself out there as a, somebody to join. 
Thank you, Chase. We would love for that. We'd love for you to join the executive committee. Um, would certainly, if there's any other individuals who'd like to nominate themselves or others would like to just give folks at least another minute to put that out there and then we'll turn to voting. Yeah. There's just one uh, note um, in my chat. I can only respond to you uh, or Cynthia. So this has to be a public vote. So everybody- I noticed, I noticed the same thing, Barla. Yeah. yeah, so it has to, it has to be um, opened up so everybody sees the vote. Thank you, Chase. You see, you're gonna make a great <laughs> member. <laughs> So I think we can move Chase's nomination to the executive committee um, to a vote. Yeah, I'm still seeing it uh, going to Liz. Yeah. Uh, it should be changed now. There it is. Yeah, we can select okay, everyone. So could everybody yeah, choose everyone? And um, I, to, I will mark this. Uh, Thank you all. And for folks, as Barla said, please be sure to hit everybody. And then this is a vote to approve Chase as the new executive committee member. Yes. Yes. It looks like we've got a, I think that's enough people. I think we've got seven, so. And Chase, you can vote for yourself. <laughs> Well, if I think I can call that even yeah. without Chase's vote. Oh, Great. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Chase. We're excited to have you join the executive committee and congratulations. We look forward to working with you more closely. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And then just a couple of other flags, I think, from last month's meeting. Um, Farla raised some opportunities for FAB members to represent FAB on other um, boards and councils. Specifically last week or last month, we heard about First Five as well as an opening on the Human Services Coordinating Council. Um, we heard from Barbie that she's interested in representing FAB at the Human Services Coordinating Council. So very excited to hear that and she'll be participating and we look forward to kind of hearing how the first meeting goes. But just wanted to make everyone aware that should, you know, if you have some interest in joining the first five committee um, that there is still space for FAB representation. Um, and if you are interested, please be sure to connect with Farla. Um, and Farla, I know there's like a lot of other opportunities for FAB members. These are just sort of the two that we're looking at right now, but there are other places where there, there is interest in FAB representation. Is that correct? Um, yes, these are two that we're, they have slots for us and okay. should be filling actually. Um, okay. But yeah, there are other boards um, that we members could, um, they're not designated for a FAB member, but they okay. can, uh, definitely, participate. And um, we will be discussing the Public Safety and Justice Agency um, in terms of having a position for a FAB member on that too. So, but if you'd like more information about either the first five or the coordinating council, um, just let us know um, and we'll provide more information. Farley, it doesn't look like Dr. Kassiri is on quite yet. So do you want to provide the update on the alternatives to 911 agenda item? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention one more thing um, about the, um, the youth member for uh, FAB. So um, there, a lot has been happening around uh, youth mental health. As you probably know, we had a whole presentation and we have a subcommittee that looked into it. Fab wrote a, a letter of recommendation to the board of supervisors, and we had a presentation that went extremely well. And so now it was fantastic. And we um, also were um, aware that the mental health board uh, also, in, not just, I don't think they have a, a youth representative, but there is a youth 
mental health board now. So it came to uh, me that I thought perhaps one of our vacant positions, and we have many, <laughs> unfortunately, which I'll discuss after, but um, one of our vacant positions on our board could be for a youth. And um, I checked with uh, our chief counsel, Rick Heyer, and he said he saw no problem with that. Um, in discussing this with some people, including uh, Bina, who, who was very involved. Um, I think because of our schedule, um, we meet at 12 to 1.30 during the weekday. Um, it might be hard for a, a high school student to participate, but we might try and tap the college students and see if we could get some participation um, from somebody there. And that would give us uh, some insight into that demographic, I think that we would benefit from. Um, so I was wondering how people felt about that. Um, so could um, the FAB members please weigh in about this and uh, let me know if you uh, think that's a good idea. So you can either, um, Joeful has his hand up. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Kaufman, I appreciate it. I am uh, full support of this um, and, and also encourage um, perhaps in the recruitment of potential members to work with not just the high school, but maybe folks, younger folks who are kind of going through their mid-career programs, especially the ones that are participating in either CNU, Cal North State, or going through a nursing program in Sac State. Um, you know, I, I think the more uh, folks realize that policymaking can be made in, in these groups and not just in the primary care setting, that'd be really great. And it's kind of a win-win situation because they, they I, I know for a fact that if some folks at, at CNU, at Cal North State, need to have volunteer hours. So it, it would be a, a good idea. And I think that would bring a fresh perspective and I'm all for it. Thank you so much for bringing this up. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts and your support. Um, Sarah? Um, hi, yes. So I, of course, am very much in support of this, and I would actually recommend having sort of a little bit of a conversation about what, I guess there's a couple things depending how we want to do it. I think we have to be really careful. There are a lot of different types of youth. There are youth who are fortunate enough to be in university, um, who can represent certain backgrounds and demographics. There are kids who may not go to university and who work in a trade area. So just given the vast representation of what youth can mean, um, I think we should talk a little bit, what would the terms of reference be? What kind of capacity building? Is there some kind of like mentorship that would be needed or a little extra sort of coaching to not to influence, but to understand how this board works. Um, uh, and then the other piece again, is I just think we should be cognizant that if we get a guy who is second year at university and from an affluent community, that's going to be a very different representation that, you know, if we get somebody from, you know, another sort of demographic area, geographic area. So I would actually propose that we have a little bit more discussion um, around what we're looking for and why and, and um, just, we just need to be cognizant that one, one youth representative will not represent all youth. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your thoughts. And this is absolutely true. We need to be able to, I mean, we, we're constrained in, in just the concept of when somebody can attend, but I right. totally agree with you that we would like this youth to have some representation from areas that need more attention. Absolutely. Um, and my putting it out there, a university student, because it started with the high school students who had presented to us and who were involved in peer-to-peer -peer counseling and what was going on in, in high school youth right. mental health. However, it, you're totally right. We, we um, in, in expanding it to anybody who could attend and be representative of um, populations, youth populations that don't necessarily come through university and we wouldn't necessarily hear the needs and uh, conditions in their demographic. So um, this is just starting a conversation about this. And certainly we can have lots of discussion 
and um, get a lot of people's input and see um, how we can best, um, you know, sort of recruit um, people out there who could give us the best insight into making changes that are important for that um, entire demographic and, and certainly for the disadvantaged demographic, uh, especially because they are, as you noted, very hard to hear from in many yeah. cases. Great, and I'm noticing Liz's comments on the side and I think, yes, we, any discussion items would be brought up verbally. Um, and I, I really think about equity uh, I think a lot about racial equity. I think a lot about um, you know underserved populations in, in our community um, uh, and the like. So I'm happy. I would love to be able to participate in this. However, we move it forward. Again, also with the adolescent subgroup. So however, I can. And also, there are many things that Fab can do. Um, if we have a representative, it doesn't mean that's the only way we can access that group uh, or demographic. Right. Certainly, we have what options we use now, subcommittees. We have working committees that we can enable to recruit representatives from the community to serve on the committee, not just the FAB members. So that would expand our representation. Um, so there are many, many ways of doing that. Would this be a retreat item, Barla? It is actually, okay. I, I've, there, uh, we, we don't have the agenda yet, but it is because we, we have to discuss this in uh, a public forum. Great. As, uh, I think Liz put in, yes, we have the Brown Act. So it's, it's to get people thinking about this. So. Awesome, great, lots thank of, you. Lots of possibilities. Any other comments on this item? No. I don't see any. Okay. All right. Um, so now we can move on. Did you um, did you want me to go through? So let me just check the the. Uh... Hey, Farla. I see Dr. K has joined. Oh, great. Oh, good. Great. Can we, Dr. K? Can we have your update? Thank you so much for joining. I know you're busy today. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so with COVID, the numbers are still going up. I have not received an update for this, um, this week from up for our dashboard, but we know the numbers are continuing to go up and we are getting a lot of reports, but most people do have mild disease and um, our hospitals are still in good shape as far as um, COVID goes. So uh, one question that we've been asked from time to time is if we're thinking of um, and new restrictions, and um, we are not, we are continuing with the strong recommendations for masking and also continuing to offer a vaccine, um, especially in the uh, underserved communities. Um, as far as monkeypox, we, Sacramento County has now um, diagnosed three cases. Uh, all the cases, the, the first was related to travel to Europe and the others are uh, were identified through contact tracing. So we're very busy working on that um, and identifying different contacts and also uh, providing information. Uh, we are offering vaccine. This is a newer vaccine. It's not the old smallpox vaccine. This is newer. It was approved in 2019. Um, to, so we're offering that to the contacts that have been identified. It's not being offered to the general public. Um, and then also for the cases, uh, especially if uh, for the newer diagnosis, we are um, going to be working with this to offer them treatment. It's, uh, it's a new uh, medication also, TPOX. So working with the CDC on that um, and well, on protocols. Um, very brief update. So I don't know if you, any of you have questions. No questions, okay. All right, 
Sunal, you wanna? No, thank you, Dr. Kasiri. I appreciate the update, especially on monkeypox. I was not aware that there was a third case now, so I appreciate that update. Um, Farla, I think that actually then goes back to you then to do an update on the alternatives to 911. Farla, are you, I don't know if you're talking. I think you're on mute. Thank you. Yes, I was. It's I'll like, go ahead. So sure. uh, dizzying get coming off and, and going back on <laughs> mute. Um, I just wanted to use this as an example to show people um, what we've been doing. And I know there are uh, new members who are, who are following what the FAB has been doing recently with the committees and the presentations. And, and I, I'm not sure you know all of the meetings that occur in the background, um, but I think um, you have some sense of it. Oops. Can somebody um, mute? Yeah. So, sorry, that's me. Oh. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway. Your cough sounds really bad. <laughs> that, that is my daughter, the veterinarian. <laughs> so that's her uh, phone call uh, marker. Anyway, so I just wanted to um, give members who may not have been around at the time some sense of what we do. Um, there's a, a lot, we, we do write a lot of recommendations to the Board of Supervisors and they don't get, a, they haven't gotten as much attention in the past, but I'm, I'm so excited about this. Um, I was talking with the Mental Health Board uh, Chair and um, we, we were talking about the, the latest, that alternatives to 911 effort. And what, what FAB looked at um, in um, mid, 2020 was this issue of um, trying to find a way for Sacramento County to have a, an alternatives to 911 where that meant when there was a mental health crisis that the somebody besides law enforcement could be the entity that you call to come out and respond and how that response would look um, in terms of peer groups, um, social workers, people who were trained in um, answering the response so that it, it, it was a de-escalation, not an escalation experience for the person involved, that there were a number of programs across the country, uh, not a lot, uh, two or three that were very interesting. Uh, one in Eugene, Oregon, that was long standing. I think it's 20 years in, in existence, and another in Colorado. And that um, there, there were people very interested. I know um, Supervisor Kennedy was a proponent of this early on, that we could form a, a program to, to um, have this as a, an option instead of. Uh, instead of law enforcement. And uh, we know there has been a lot of gains in the in Sacramento County, behavioral health and uh, the health services has been working very hard on this to provide more services, um, more places to bring people instead of the <laughs> emergency department, instead of um, the option of, you know, charging somebody with a crime, but more in response to responding at a, an appropriate level and not having it escalate to the point where there, there is a criminal a component to it. Um, but anyway, so we wrote a letter and it's up on the screen and um, it should be on our website, but in, if you would like, uh, uh, we'll, we'll send it out after this. And you can read along with it that we in, endorse this in a major way. Um, again, this letter was in, dated November 2020. In response to this, um, and Liz, you can go down to the, I think further down, you see some recommendations in it. Um, yeah, so our, th there are primary recommendations that um, it be um, this, this system be trauma-informed care and it be easily accessible 
and it should not involve law enforcement um, in, in one sense, and then predominantly peer led um, and representatives of the, of the community. And in addition to the planning and implementation should be conducted with partnership. And behavioral health has done an amazing job. They um, had early on when the pilot was proposed, they had meetings with the public. Um, they presented uh, in webinars the, what their view is, how they were implementing it. They, they took feedback from the community and, and implemented it wherever possible. And the program is really uh, terrific in, in the sense that now it's huge and on and up and running in many regards and that the mental health board has um, formed a working committee uh, on this issue. Uh, currently they're looking for a new, uh, a new name for it. It's current, I, I think it, the, the name is Wellness Crisis Call Center and Response Team and they, they want it to be a bit user, more user friendly, but I will uh, send out links to documents on this if you'd like to look at them about the uh, advisory committee. And, and again, there's uh, people, public, anybody of the of FAB can sit on the committee, also apply to be on the committee. But it, it, there are very extensive documents um, in regards to the program and, and it, its progress. And I just encourage you to look at those because it's so encouraging that in, you know, two years, this is this has made a lot of progress. So I wanted to use it as an example that we don't necessarily have to, you know, take a, a project that we've identified to um, for recommendations to endorse to the board of supervisors. We as FAB don't have to um, do all the research and and that's not what our job is necessarily for the um, uh, Correctional Health uh, Working Committee has gone above and beyond because it's such a complex issue. And I just, it's amazing how much work and effort and, and amazing recommendations have come out. Um, and that, however, is not the norm for us. This could be another example that we had recommendations. We looked at it, we got presentations from behavioral health about it. We had some meetings after that and some investigation, but after our recommendation, it went forward and it's it's been taken over um, by mental health board and, and, a, and an advisory board and a lot of excellent things have been happening. So that's another example of how we work, how we've worked in the past, how it can work in the future. We wanna elevate certain subjects and certain recommendations to the Board of Supervisors, that's our job. And we can do it in many arenas, in many ways, um, not, not so labor intensive. Uh, they don't all need to be that. And, and certainly, again, the subcommittee for youth mental health was uh, an example of that. Um, hopefully, a lot of our recommendations that we've just brought um, to the board will be implemented um, with money from the the budget, hopefully. Um, and that hasn't been an intense uh, use of time and effort. Um, it's been it, it's been a lot, but not not anything like the working committee. So I'm encouraging people, members of FAB to get involved in areas to identify what their interests are and where they see that we can make a difference, what needs to be elevated and brought to the attention of the Board of Supervisors. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to sign away, you know, half of your downtime in life. Um, but please get, get involved. See this as, a, a, an, a, as a, um, an exciting opportunity that here's an example, and this can be true of different areas going forward. So that's my pitch to you. Um, are there any questions? And, and also, in, if you're interested in this, we can also bring people in from the county and from the mental health board to talk about this, if you really are interested in this subject matter to follow it through. But really, it's an example in this regard for people to see a way of becoming involved in an area that they can bring to FAB and say, you know, this is one of my pet areas that I'm interested in. 
So any questions, any comments? Okay. Well, some of this we'll bring up in, in the retreat and the retreat is the uh, next issue on the agenda. So I'm just gonna move into that area, <laughs> if that's okay, and um, talk about a bit about the retreat and about the um, possible topics, if there's no other questions about this one. Okay, so we have a retreat on the schedule. July 7th, and originally we had 10 uh, of our 11 members. Now I've uh, received a note that um, Barbie can also attend that, uh, that meeting. Uh, and Barbie is um, one of our long standing members. So she brings a lot, of, uh, a lot of history, a lot of experience, and she is very, um, uh, she has a perfect view of the emergency medical services response. Um, and uh, is a um, high-ranking member of the CAL FIRE. So I'm sure she'll bring a lot of information as well the rest of our PHAB FAB members. So we have a full complement of members coming to the retreat. The retreat is gonna be July 7th. Um, it's actually uh, on the agenda for five to 8.30, but really it's gonna be 5.30 to 8.30. And we are working on supplying food and we'll see how that works out. Um, but it will be held in the Sierra Health Foundation. They're very kind in uh, donating their space to um, nonprofit organizations to hold meetings. So we will be there. And um, we um, would like the members to propose topics that they would like to bring up at the, the meeting. We will be surveying you <laughs> about those. Um, and talking to you individually, if we haven't already, um, in terms of what you would like to bring to FAB, to FAB and how you see your role, how you see FAB's role. A lot of topics on the agenda um, um, that we're gonna you know, try and condense and, and uh, get to everything in some way or another. Um, does anybody have any questions about the retreat? No. Does, um, can we talk now? Uh, do people have an idea of, uh, I see one in the, the um, yeah. So thank you, Jen. There's a question in the chat. Is the retreat open to the public? Okay, so we, it is open to the public because we as FAB are under the auspices of the Brown Act. So we must be uh, open whenever we meet. Um, I am sorry to say that if we have food um, available, it is not going to be to the public as well, but um, definitely you can attend if you would like. Um, it, um, so if anybody has any ideas about what they would like to hear at the retreat or what they think an important agenda item is to put onto the retreat agenda, please let us know, let me know. Um, you can put anything you want in the chat right now. Um, I, you can send suggestions um, to me uh, and Liz. I see Joeful has a, um, a hand up. Hi. Thank, thank you, Farla. I just uh, gonna sound like a broken uh, record here, but <laughs> any, anything that we can do on kind of our greater statewide advocacy. Uh, the only reason I say this is because this morning I was meeting with like SoCal Public Health Alliance. They are very organized and in the budget cycle, they're looking at about 300 million in a three year, uh, three year program. So they made the ask. And I think that as a region, we could also make an ask. We, we're coming from very disparate voices, but I think we can be unified in certain goals. And I think we have enough members to get some juice. And so um, any anything that we can do kind of in a broader context outside of the halls of FAB and outside of the halls of Sacramento County as, as subject matter experts and folks that are very tied into the community. If we can just take a look at what we can do, what we can bring in and make a bigger ask for the state for investments, even matching dollars, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Joe Phil. Um, we can talk about that. Um, I would also like to uh, just let you know, hmm. 
I guess Olivia's off and Sandy and uh, Siobhan was in here. But uh, one of the issues I was concerned about was uh, public health infrastructure and staffing, which was a priority issue for FAB this year. And um, my thoughts were maybe we could get a letter of recommendation out to the Board of Supervisors because over the many decades that budget has been slashed and we saw the effects in the response to COVID, how hard it was for public health and how heroically they responded and so many hours of overtime by the limited staff. But I am happy to say that the state has um, allocated uh, many millions of dollars over a number of years. Um, so it's not a one-time um, funding to public health, to build up public health um, offices across the, the state. So they are not in need of um, much more funding from the county at this point. They have still have COVID funds and they now have an ongoing promise from the state. So that is good to know. Um, in terms of Jofel, if you would like to um, put it that on the agenda, I can do that and let us know a little bit more information about where you see us being able to influence this and what the greatest needs are. That would be very interesting to, to be able to start the discussion. Um, and Farla, I'll note just to, from what's in the chat, um, this will be posted on the PHAB website with the information about the retreat, just like the PHAB meetings are. Um, yes. So folks will be able to um, access that information via the PHAB website. Yes, absolutely. It will be noticed in uh, with uh, a long lead time. So that means everybody has to get on board of uh, voicing their opinions and <laughs> sending in topic preferences and um, absolutely. And I see, um, thank you, Jen. She says she would like to attend. Um, and yes, ED overcrowding is a big issue still for us. And you know, uh, you've been attending these meetings long enough to have seen a lot of presentations on this issue and, um, and we'll, we'll hopefully be able to get information together and from the county on the position of this, um, in, including any inroads we've made. I, we heard from um, behavioral health or substance use that there are uh, a lot of efforts to get people processed in the ED who come in with um, substance uh, use problems. Um, that, that should be true about uh, mental health as well. And so that will be um, an issue that I'm bringing up. So absolutely, please join us and, uh, and we'll, we'll um, tackle that at the retreat. And Steve says, I, I think it would be helpful to put a review of the FAB charter on the agenda. Um, we can do that too. Thank you for the uh, suggestion. Um, okay. And we will have to um, look at, uh, you know, it's, it's an, uh, an opportunity to stay, take a step backward, uh, step not backward, but back a little bit to get a wider view to see what we've looked at. I periodically I've sent out the topics that we've chosen to be of priorities, but I think it's a good opportunity to just take a look at those again and um, and see what what still needs our attention or if there are other topics that need more, our attention more urgently and so they might surplant those <laughs> you know it's nice that there is progress in certain areas um anything else hi carla this is libby um i just wanted to kind of second your topic i'm most interested in talking about what our priorities are as we have, what are our goals, and then sort of translating those priorities into um, some steps. Who are we going to bring in to speak to? What are our subgroups? What are, and connecting that dot to sort of what is everybody personally passionate about just to sort of bring more energy back to PHAB. Um, and I, I think with three hours, we could spend quite a bit of time on something like that. So I'd love to see that be a real focus of discussion. Wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. 
we do need some more energy here, guys. Uh, I know sometimes I feel like there's too much dead space and it's a bit awkward. And I, I <laughs> so people should feel um, engaged and, um, and anxious to voice opinions and bring up their preferences. So we will definitely have that on the agenda um, topics. Maybe a student nurse or public health. Uh, okay. All right. If there's nothing else, as I said, feel free to send in some suggestions um, to Liz and myself. Okay. So now I'll turn it back to you. And thank you so much for facilitating. I appreciate it from the East Coast. <laughs> no, thanks, Farla. Appreciate you stepping into um, hearing no questions or additional feedback. I think we can adjourn this meeting a couple minutes early and give folks five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, Liz, go ahead. Public comment period still. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, before we do close out, I wanted to I want to make sure we open it up to any public comment or questions. Apologies for that oversight. It's easy to oversee that uh, to not oversee it, but, you know, to skip that because I think we've become wonderful in terms of being inclusive and people feel free to offer public comment at various times on various uh, agenda items throughout the meeting. So I'm very proud of Fab for, for doing that and, um, and bearing with the, sometimes, you know, it, it gets a little time consuming for some agenda items, but I think it's really important. So thank you to all the members for, for supporting that. And to the folks who did provide public comment and question, we do appreciate it and appreciate everyone's engagement. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mac. You've been <laughs> nice and vocal.